So as I uh, was just introduced, my name is Jeffrey Hall. I am a uh, strategic account manager at Green Hills Software. I have a computer science background. I've been at Green Hills now for about 18 years. And if you haven't heard of Green Hills in the past, I'll talk a little about who we are and uh, why you should listen to us. But we're here to talk about some of the underlying technologies that are critical to the proper execution of software on flight systems, defense systems, aerospace, a number of other things. When we looked at the flight software guidelines that were sent out, we saw a couple of areas that we thought really were areas that we had a lot of expertise in, that we thought we could contribute a lot to the discussion. So in this presentation today, I'll be talking about the challenge of multi-core. Certainly when you're talking about software going from single core to multi-core really opens a Pandora's box. We'll be talking about flight processors and operating systems. Uh, Green Hills at its core is an operating system and development tools company. We have a lot of experience there. And then finally, we'll be talking a little bit about software verification validation, moving from single core to multi-core in a flight system or any other system dramatically increases the testing requirements because there are so many different ways your system can execute. And we'll be talking a little bit about Green Hills and, uh, and who we are. So whenever I listen to a presentation from someone, the first thing I always wonder is why should I listen to you? So why should you listen to what Green Hills software has to say? We are the embedded software experts. Green Hills has been around <coughs> since uh, early 80s. We were actually or we are founded by and originally headquartered here in Pasadena uh, by a guy named Dan O'Dowd. He is a Caltech grad. Uh, he started Green Hills back in the early 80s and then moved to Santa Barbara where we're now headquartered in the early 90s. Uh, we are a CMMI level three certified development team. If you know what that means, that's a reasonably impressive thing to say. And we had originally started as a compiler company, and we added development tools. And then in the mid-90s, we added our operating system, which has now grown to a family of operating systems. But we had originally developed our operating system as a defense and aerospace operating system. It was developed for the B-1B, Boeing B-1B long distance bomber. And that was because at the time, there was no commercially available memory protected operating system for embedded systems. So we said, we can help solve this problem. Uh, when we were having discussions with Boeing, they told us that they had many hundreds of thousands of lines of code, all of which were executing in kernel space. And as you can imagine, our founder, CEO, chairman, and chief engineer at the time said, that's pretty scary. And the guy from Boeing that he was working with said, yeah, it's extremely scary. I wish we had another solution. So we developed Integrity to solve that problem. Green Hills has been profitable every year since 1983. So ran a loss for the first year or two. And then we've been profitable every year since through all the ups and downs of the embedded system and general economy. We are privately held, 100% self-funded, and all of our products are developed in the USA by US citizens. That's important for many defense and aerospace companies. They need to have software that is free from foreign influence, and we do provide that in all of our products. So as I mentioned, some of our original design wins were in aerospace and defense. Since then, we've grown to provide software for most of the leading companies in the industry, as well as a number of satellites and spacecraft. So we have the CEV, the Orion Crew Exploration Vehicle, GPS-3, which is the next generation GPS, whole fleet of satellites for that. We are deployed in those. OCX, which is related to GPS. Uh, a AEHF, which is Advanced Extremely High Frequency Communication Satellite Systems. Uh, FabT, Omega-3, and then the most recent thing that we just won is the JPL and NASA mission to Europa that will be launching in the early 2020s. I think it's currently scheduled for 2022. <coughs> And that will be going to one of the moons of Jupiter to do a variety of analyses on the area. It may even include a lander. There's lots of interesting things going on there. So those are just some of the ones that we can talk about. Of course, there's many more that for a variety of confidentiality reasons we can't discuss. But here are some people who thought enough of our solution to want to actually do posters with us. The Japanese Space Agency is on the left. I don't know if you can read that. It's kind of pixelated down there. 
Uh, but that's a Japanese ex um, space exploration organization. On the right, there's a poster talking about the CEV. On the left, that's the Europa mission, the JPL. And on the right, that's the B-1B bomber, again, the, the first system that we were used in. We have lots of these, many more examples. But the reason you should again listen to us is we are the experts on safe and secure systems. And what does flight software need? Well, bottom line, it needs safety and security. So there's a great quote that came out of the NSA, National Security Agency, back in about 2005. And the quote is, the threats posed by the modern computing environment cannot be addressed without support from secure operating systems. Any security effort which ignores that fact can only result in a fortress built upon sand. So the reality is when you look at a system, no part of your system can be more secure or more reliable than the underlying operating system. If you're built on a unreliable or insecure system, no amount of additional security you add on top of it will result in a more secure system. You have to use a secure or reliable underlying operating system or you will not have true security. Of course, then the question becomes, how do you know if the system you're using is reliable and safe? Everybody says that their system is reliable and safe, right? You can write your own operating system. You believe it's secure and reliable. You use Linux, you use something else. And everyone believes that their system is safe and reliable. Well, we believe that the only way you can really know if something is safe and reliable is by having a variety of third-party evaluations that have done uh, various security and reliability analyses on your system. So here's a list of some of them. Uh oh, this thing says it's low on battery. Hopefully that solves the problem. Okay, so you see there at the top the FAA D0178B level A. I'm curious, how many people here are familiar with the FAA D178B? Just a few. Okay, so this is a very interesting reliability standard. If you look at the entire history of commercial aviation in the United States, spans many, many decades, ever since the FAA instituted the standard called D0178B, it has been used to evaluate the reliability of aircraft. Anything that flies in US commercial airspace must have and have been approved by the FAA to this standard. There's five levels, A through E. Level E basically means if there's a failure in the system, has no effect on the aircraft. Level A means if there's a failure, it will lead to catastrophic loss of life and or aircraft. So level E is your entertainment system. Level A is your navigation and engine control systems. To date, out of all the crashes that have happened in aviation in the United States since this in, uh, standard was instituted, never once has the software that's been in, evaluated to level A ever been implicated in a crash. That is 100% reliability of all software that's been evaluated to level A. It's a pretty strong statement. It's really the only type of software evaluation that can say that where they have never once had a failure if it's been evaluated to level A ever. Decades and decades and decades. Out of all the planes that have flown, the tens of thousands of flights every day over many decades, never once has there been a crash due to software. The, our operating system has been evaluated to level A. There's also things like the NSA. The NSA does security and evaluations. What's interesting about the security evaluation is that they do what's called formal methods analysis where they actually look at your code and do a mathematical proof to see if your code is secure. This is only possible if your kernel is of a certain size. Uh, they say the math kind of breaks down when you get above about 50,000 lines of code. You look at something like a Windows or a Linux, you're looking at millions of lines of code in the kernel. It's not possible to do this formal methods analysis. Um, so that's another way that you know that a system is secure. And there's others here as well, the FDA for medical. Um, there's also industrial control and automotive and other standards here as well. So we believe that the only way to truly develop a secure and reliable system is to first base your system on a secure and reliable operating system that's been certified by a number of third party organizations to some interesting levels of security and reliability. So let's talk about multi-core now, which of course is one of the things that the FSW for this year is focused on. 
we have seen that the future in flight is clearly multi-core. If you look at commercial systems, everyone's going multi-core. I mean, it's almost impossible to find a single core processor to start a new project on. It's all multi-core. Had an interesting conversation with someone recently who is developing satellites, and I asked them, you, know, you look at just a couple of years ago, the only thing that was available really was this rad hardened processor from BAE, the rad 750 at 133 megahertz. I mean, this thing is like ancient technology. And all of a sudden today, you've got things like the HPSC, the High Performance Space Computing System, that has been spec'd out by NASA and JPL over here on the right, which is a quad core, each core running at I think a gigahertz. I mean, it is exponential growth in processing power. What are these people gonna be doing with this huge jump in processing power in satellites, right? And the reality is that the future in flight is more autonomy. When you look at the amount of time it takes to communicate with your satellite or spacecraft, minutes, hours sometimes, depending how far away you are, you just can't do interactive uh, discussions with your satellite over what it should be doing. You need to give it a mission, and you need to be able to go and accomplish that mission with no input from ground control. And that is going to require a lot of additional computing power to do things like program the neural nets and have all the space-based mission computing capabilities to do an analysis of what it should be doing in each of these different complex areas. But of course, as anyone who's ever developed multi-core systems know, it is extremely complex. We have seen many customers who, different. what's that? It's just different. It's simpler, but it's just different. It's simpler, as I said, for multi-core? Okay, well, I, I'm gonna have to disagree with you there because we have had many customers who have, okay, who have taken code that runs on a single core system, multi-threaded system, multi-threaded application running on a single core system, and now what you've done is you've taken something that is logically running concurrently, that is two tasks that appear to be running concurrently using multitasking on a single core system. All of a sudden they are actually running concurrently. And if you haven't properly protected critical sections, you haven't properly worried about things like mutexes, suddenly your system will not work correctly. You also have things like performance, huge potential performance hits where if a task is bouncing between two different cores, it runs first on core one, then it runs on core zero, then it runs on core one, it's gonna run much more slowly than it would have run on a single core system because you're flushing the cache each time, you're having a lot of cache misses when you jump from core to core. So there are a, a lot of complexities, a lot of things you have to worry about when you move to multi-core. Now one of the ways that everybody tries to handle complexity on a either a multi-core or a single core system is through partitioning. And if you're looking at true partitioning, what that means is partitioning both in time and space domains. Time meaning you give one part of the system 10% of the CPU, another part of the system 40% CPU, another part of the system 50% of the CPU. It all adds up to 100%. And what a subsystem does with its CPU time is therefore not going to affect the rest of the system, okay? But there's also partitioning in space, and now it means space is in up there, I mean space is in um, the amount of memory you have on your system. This is, goes beyond just memory protection. This is also things like you need to guarantee that no part of the subsystem will affect any other subsystem. So um, you need to guarantee that they have separate file systems, that they have separate memory pools. So if you do malloc and free, uh, one of the real problems in most desktop operating systems like a Linux or a Windows is that there's a single free memory pool. So you can do a malloc attack where you have a single thread that just does nothing but while one malloc 1000 over and over and over again eats up all the memory in the system. Pretty soon you start going to virtual memory. Pretty soon your system slows down. You can't do anything. Okay, I'm sure we've all played with that at some point back in college or on your own computer. It will bring down your entire system. You can't do anything. That's because there's only one memory store and you do not have true protection from task to task. A true partitioned operating system provides capabilities where each subsystem has its own memory pool. So you can exhaust your own memory pool, you don't affect another subsystem's memory pool. That's critical for true reliability in a space system. So this is primarily used when people are moving from uh, multi-core systems where they're separate to, I should say, multi-systems with multi-cores to a multi-core system. And typically we're seeing this for a swap, size, weight, and power reduction. You take 
You used to have 10 processors, you want to go to a single processor. You're planning on doing that by consolidating everything that used to run on many slow processors onto a single faster processor. A lot of advantages to doing this, of course, but the main disadvantage is it adds complexity, like I mentioned before. So one way that customers try and attack this problem is what's called heterogeneous multiprocessing, where you might have, in this case, an eight core processor, and you lock subsystems to a specific core. So in a spacecraft, you might have your power management. Maybe that power management uh, doesn't work. Maybe you have your power management locked to this core here. This is your communication. This is your flight control. And this is your science experiments. And what this allows you to do is guarantee that maybe the important stuff over here isn't affected by a potential failure in the less important stuff like your science experiments. However, what most people want to do today is use a true symmetric multiprocessing system. That is, you have one operating system that controls all of the processors, automatically schedules everything, handles all of your shared resources, and makes the system as easy to program as programming on a Windows or a Linux system. So that is, we believe, the future, especially on, among multi-core systems, is this ability to take an operating system, have it control the entire system, but it has to provide certain capabilities to enable your system to run uh, as well or better and more reliably than it did on a single core system. There's also things that are space-specific requirements, things that we have found our customers need when they're going into space. So uh, the previous presenter mentioned rad-hardened processors, absolutely true. Uh, as you put a spacecraft up in space, especially if you're going to deep space, certain areas of the solar system have much higher levels of radiation than near-Earth orbit. You know, for example, the Europa mission is going to be going to Europa, a moon of Jupiter, that is one of the highest radiation areas in the entire solar system due to the insane amounts of radiation coming off of Jupiter. What you have is potential degradation of the hardware as your system is making its journey to, in this case, Europa. What that can cause, even with proper shielding, using a rad hardened processor, um, even with shielding the CPU and things around it, what you still can have is pieces of flash or RAM can become non-functional during the trip. If you've got a three-year trip to Europa, that's three years of these things being bombarded. You get close to Europa, you fire up the part of the system that's supposed to handle the landing, for example, or the orbiting, and all of a sudden you find that maybe one out of every 256 blocks of RAM or flash have gone bad due to radiation. So you're, you need an operating system that can do things like map around these bad blocks, both in memory and in flash. Um, of course, there's no easy boot reboot in space. Um, so one thing you need to be able to do is update the satellite or spacecraft in, in transit. The way that can often work is you can launch a system with excess capabilities at launch. And then as it's flying to its target, you can provide additional capabilities as it goes. Here's how this works. So I showed you before we had this idea of partitioning where you have maybe lower priority things, higher priority things. The way you can implement this in a spacecraft is you launch with, let's say, only 60% of the CPU time actually being used. Maybe 20% here, 20% here, 20% here. The nice thing about this is if you're using a partitioned operating system, it will allocate 20% to each of these uh, five partitions. During the 20% of the time when this partition's running, it literally does nothing. Then it switches to the next partition, 20% of the time it does nothing. What's nice about this is it allows you to guarantee that these three subsystems will behave exactly the same once you've uploaded something to these subsystems, to these partitions. You know that this is going to run in 20%, this is going to run in 20%, this is going to run in 20%. This is in stark contrast to the way that many people do it today, where they'll launch their system with each one of these subsystems getting one third of the CPU time, it's then hard to test that once you upload something that expects to get a quarter of the time, these other subsystems have to get a quarter of the time as well, so they have to be able to run in different amounts of CPU time. That makes your system less deterministic, makes it harder to test, 
much higher chance of bad things happening. And then finally, we believe strongly that flight software development tools are critical to deploying a truly secure and reliable system. As I mentioned, there's no reset button space. If your system fails, it's gonna turn into a flying brick. How do you present, how do you prevent that? Well, there are a number of different reliability standards. One that we think is interesting is MISRA, which stands for the Motor Industry um, Software Reliability Association. So back when C was just starting to make its uh, beachhead into the automotive industry, the automotive manufacturers decide they want to use C, but there are a lot of scary things in C that are perfectly legal to do, but can cause a lot of failures. For example, there's something called uh, side effects in evaluation. So if you think of a, an if statement that says if A or B++, totally legal code. What happens is, because of the way the short circuit operator works with C compilers, this is part of the standard, is if A is true, the second part of that statement will not get evaluated. And it will just jump down into the if statement. If A is not true, it then evaluates the second part to see if that's true, B++, which then increments B and see if that new incremented value is not zero. So if A is true, then B does not get changed. If A is not true, then B++ gets evaluated and B gets incremented by one. Weird code, totally legal, but not great for software reliability because it doesn't do the same thing every time. The value of B essentially depends on the value of A. So we believe things like MISR are interesting and should be looked at very closely by people doing high reliability, high security systems. Uh, we believe it's very important to develop with an eye towards testability. For example, as I mentioned in that previous slide, the idea of partitioning your system, guaranteeing certain amounts of CPU time to certain subsystems, and even if that means doing nothing for some amount of the time, it makes it very easy to guarantee your system is gonna behave the right way when you actually fly in space. Uh, we believe in using new debugging modalities, so a lot of the new chips these days have trace capabilities, which are just fantastic for doing analysis of your system as you do debug, really, really powerful stuff. Use simulation when possible, use tools that allow you to visualize how your system executes, and really you need to come up with a game plan because when we have done our analysis talking to our customers about what the hardest bugs are that they face, these are the th things they tell us. Stack overflows, okay? Race conditions, it becomes even trickier when you go into a multi-core system. Buffer overflows, that's, I think I read somewhere, it's like 50% of all security issues that get patched these days are, are all due to buffer overflows, somewhere in operating system code or application code. Memory leaks, we all know the problems with these. Uninitialized variables, memory corruption, and then what we call Heisenbugs, uh, non-reproducible bugs, where you've got a bug in some part of your code, you put a printf to try and see what's going on, now the bug moves somewhere else, you put a printf around there, and the bug moves somewhere else, because it's all based on timing. Uh, it's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle as uh, reproduced in software. It's just awful. You need a way to solve these problems, a deterministic path you can follow to find these problems. Multi-core, I mentioned before, requires vastly more testing and validation. So for example, we looked at our own kernel when we went from a single core to a multi-core kernel. We didn't actually have to add that many lines of code to our kernel to make it multi-core capable. It only went from about 15,000 lines of code in the kernel to 19,000 lines of code. So, you know, less, less than 25, well, 25 ish percent, we'll say. But the number of lines of code we had to write to test multi core versus single core went up by a factor of 10. Okay? So, when you look at moving to a multi core system, multi core application, you need to keep this in mind that your testing requirements are going to go up huge compared to the number of lines of code you have to write. So, conclusion, moving to a multi-core system introduces significant complexity. You need to plan for it at a debugging level, plan for it at a testing level, make sure your design is correct. It's pretty clear to us that a reliable and secure operating system is the bedrock of any secure and reliable system. The only way to know if your system is in fact secure and reliable is to 
third-party tests, right? Every, everybody thinks their baby is the cutest baby in the world. Everyone thinks that their software is secure and reliable. It's not until someone else comes in and points out the deficiencies that you realize that there's probably some improvements you can make. Operating systems can be run in a variety of ways. Asymmetric multiprocessing, symmetric multiprocessing, partitioning, there's a lot of things that go into this. And ultimately, commercial quality tools are essential for developing and debugging multi-core hardware. Whew, exactly 25 minutes, all right. <laughs> Any questions?